So uh, I'm going to cover genetic and epigenetic uh, alterations. I'll try to touch what I, I think are the points that are most uh, significant. Uh, so the topics are listed here. I talk about normal and disease-associated genetic variation. And then we'll talk some uh, on epigenetics uh, as another layer of regulation of gene expression. And then we will end with uh, an example of epigenetic alterations in uh, a pediatric uh, brain tumor that, that uh, I, in my group, uh, has uh, been studying. So this depicts uh, the wide range uh, of variation. Uh, it's interesting because I was you know, looking at uh, this uh, picture uh, yesterday when I prepared this. You, know, it's, uh, you, you think of identical twins as identical. Um, yeah, I was uh, in a meeting yesterday and we were talking about um, a rare, a very rare condition where uh, children start developing obesity, totally out of control, uh, and then uh, severe uh, respiratory uh, problems that end up in ventilators, can't be taken out of ventilators. Uh, and there were, there are only about maybe 150 cases described in the, in the entire uh, world about uh, that condition. And um, there are cases of identical twins uh, within uh, the group where you have a member affected and the other not affected. Uh, so, of course, there are multiple uh, reasons why that, that could happen. But when we see something like that, one thing that one could suspect is that there would be epigenetic uh, alterations, epigenetic differences that could explain why, even though they are uh, identical twins, they end up one normal and one uh, with a disease. So it's, um, it's, a, it's an additional layer of uh, regulation uh, that, uh, as, as, as we'll discuss a little more, can really have uh, profound uh, consequences. I, we don't know that uh, for sure that's uh, what causes uh, the difference that I, uh, I, I mentioned, uh, but it's definitely a, a, a reasonable possibility. So the human genome uh, has approximately 10 million polymorphisms. Uh, what, what is meant by that is this is genetic variants that occur at a minimum frequency of 1%. So to be called a, uh, a polymorphic variant, uh, it has to occur in the population with a frequency that it's at least 1%. Many of these are single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, and undoubtedly, they, these uh, polymorphisms contribute to, the, uh, to our indiv individuality uh, and uh, certainly influence uh, susceptibility to, to disease. So the big challenge uh, that, you know, over the last uh, several years now, uh, the scientific community, by and large, they, everybody uh, is involved one way or the other in trying to uh, come up with ways and, and, and analysis to, to do associations uh, of variation in disease and to be able to discern what is normal variation from variation that, that, is, uh, that increase susceptibility uh, for development of uh, certain diseases. So it's a bit about the uh, single nucleotide the polymorphins or SNPs as they are called. This is a major source of genetic variation. Uh, uh, an, an estimated 7 million SNPs 
uh, occurring with a frequency of at least 5% and uh, about 11 million uh, with frequencies of at least 1%. So a, a tremendous amount. And uh, how can we determine the association between these variants and uh, disease? It's a daunting task, uh, but much progress has been made. So it's important to uh, note that there is uh, uh, a, a project, a HapMap project, a haplotype map a project, which uh, is a result of uh, collaboration uh, among uh, groups from different countries uh, to develop this very comprehensive database, database of genetic variation, uh, normal variation. Uh, so uh, using DNA from uh, uh, people from multiple populations, uh, a, a very comprehensive uh, database is being generated uh, so that now we can look at the uh, genomic sequence, the, the human genome sequence, and annotated uh, on the sequence are the different positions where the SNPs occur. So the, the, the sequence of the, the reference human genome sequence may have an A at a certain position, but the database will indicate that at that position, uh, others in the population might have a T or a C, whatever it may be. So variation is, uh, is indeed this, this splice of life. Uh, if any two genomes are roughly 99.9% .9 identical, and a genome comprises 3.2 billion uh, uh, bases, then every two genomes will have 3.2 million differences. Uh, so, and, 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 uh, and, and this is per haploid genome, so we have uh, two copies. So it's uh, a tremendous amount of difference that any two genomes have. And this is only considering single nucleotide polymorphisms. As you will see, this is only part of the variation that we harbor. So in these uh, whole genome association studies, what is done? Uh, you have to have uh, a group of uh, people uh, that uh, do not, that are normal uh, for that condition, and a group of people that uh, uh, have that uh, condition, that disease. So you have cases and controls, and you have to investigate all the uh, genetic uh, factors uh, that are shared uh, by uh, members of each group. So you have to uh, have genotype information for the members of each group. So you, you may find that uh, in the disease group, there is a certain combination of uh, SNP variants that occur in a particular uh, region of a chromosome that will distinguish the members of that disease group from the normal uh, group. So that becomes, uh, you know, that's statistically significant. Then that's, uh, uh, there is a, a working hypothesis that that, uh, that uh, set of variants uh, may predispose to the development of that uh, condition. So as I alluded to, uh, single nucleotide polymorphism is only one uh, type of genetic variation, a very important one, but certainly not uh, the only one, uh, and not the only significant one. Uh, not uh, too long ago, uh, we learned that uh, actually our genomes differ very significantly with respect to what's referred to as indels, insertions and deletions. Multiple uh, regions of chromosomes that will 
present with insertions in uh, an individual, uh, but not in others, the, the deletions, and so forth. Uh, then there are microsatellite or short tandem repeat uh, variation. These are uh, sequences that are, for example, uh, tri-nucleotide repeats, uh, TGT, TGT, TGT many times. So one, one individual might have 30 copies of TGT, another will have 27 or 32, and you know, that, that's uh, 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 what is referred as a microsatellite uh, variation. Then uh, um, insertions and deletions polymorphisms that are longer, uh, such as uh, 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 a retrotransposition event uh, that renders uh, uh, a genomic region uh, different uh, between, uh, you know, from one chromosome and in, in, in the homologue uh, at first. So I mentioned in, in my first presentation that uh, the human genome has a, a, a very major component of repetitive sequence. Uh, and I mentioned that these repeats were uh, at first thought to be junk DNA. And that we have been learning more recently that they, they actually, uh, uh, at least a fraction of them, uh, have a functional uh, significance. These uh, uh, repeats, there are different kinds. Uh, the the so-called retrotransposons are repeats that actually amplify in the genome by a process that's called retrotransposition. It's called retrotransposition because it is a process whereby the DNA copy of that repeat in the chromosome gets transcribed to RNA, that RNA gets inserted elsewhere in the genome, and in the genome where it got inserted, it is converted back to DNA. So the, the original repeat stays where it was. It's like a copy and paste, not a cut and paste mechanism. And uh, there is a, a, an enzyme reverse transcriptase that reverse transcribes uh, the RNA back to cDNA. So what if this happens uh, in a cell? And that is, uh, how often does uh, that happen? So uh, uh, until uh, not too long ago, that was thought to be a, a pretty rare event, even though there have been multiple cases in the literature of uh, uh, diseases that uh, were caused by the integration of one of these repeats, a retrotransposition event, uh, into a gene, disrupting a gene and causing uh, a, a disease, uh, but rare, uh, rare event. But more recently, it has uh, been shown that these, these events are actually much more prevalent uh, than uh, first thought. So this is a cause of variation, too. Uh, if you think that you have a, a, a copy of a repeat that uh, gets retrotransposed to another location, at first, you're going to have one of, uh, one of the chromosomes with this extra copy, and the other one will not have any. And then if that becomes uh, eventually fixed in the population, uh, you're going to start finding individuals who already have that copy, uh, that extra copy in both chromosomes, in both uh, in, uh, paternal and maternal chromosomes. But anyway, this is another source of variation. So when you think of, of all of these, you know, the, the variation at the single nucleotide level, uh, the, the the great number of deletions and insertions that occur all over the genome, variation of these uh, short uh, repeats, uh, uh, the novel retrotransposition events that uh, cause variation, uh, you realize that it's, it's, um, 
the, the sources of uh, variation in the amount of uh, uh, difference in genetic uh, 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 constitution that we have is, is phenomenal. Uh, so this is just a summary of the, the main types of uh, genetic variation that, that uh, uh, in addition to the single nucleotide polymorphisms, we talked about deletions, insertions, can also have inversions, uh, and this uh, copy number uh, variation, which is the insertion deletion that I was uh, uh, talking about uh, before. So, uh, this is a, 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 a map uh, from a study that was done with uh, 200 and examining 270 individuals for this copy number uh, variable region. So regions along the, the chromosomes that vary in, in number of copies uh, from individual to individual. And a total of almost 1,500 copy number variable regions were identified, which is about 12 12% of the genome, so 360 megabases uh, of DNA involved in, in this. So it's an astounding amount of uh, variation. And uh, here's a depiction of uh, all chromosomes and uh, all the positions where copy number variation was detected. Uh, and, and, and this is an important point to be made. The technology that's available to do that um, is really not uh, robust uh, and sensitive enough to enable detection of copy number alterations of sequences that are shorter than one ki kilobase, less than a thousand uh, nucleotides. So, and it's expected that actually there will be a, a, a great number of uh, copy number variation involving regions that are smaller than 1 kb. So this is an underestimation of, uh, of what the most likely variation really is. And you see that uh, based on this, uh, uh, the, the estimate is that uh, any two uh, genomes uh, will, will differ uh, by 600 to 900 of these uh, copy number uh, variable regions. So it's a tremendous amount. So when you take into account not only the, the, uh, the single nucleotide polymorphism, but also the uh, copy number variation, then uh, instead of 99.9% .9 identical, uh, humans are 99.5% uh, identical. So uh, there is a 0.5% a, a uh, difference in any two uh, individuals, irrespective of ethnicity or, or whatever. Uh, and uh, this variation is uh, completely uh, widespread uh, geographically. So how about uh, variation that is not really encoded in the, in the DNA, but it's a variation in modifications that occur to DNA and to proteins that uh, with D DNA constitute the chromosomes. Uh, how about variation in the presence or absence of these modifications that occur to DNA and to the proteins, the histone proteins that uh, a complex with uh, DNA in our chromosomes. So this is what epigenetics uh, refers to. These are a changes in, 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 uh, in gene function that are mitotically and or meiotically heritable, but that are not encoded in the DNA sequence. So Epigenetics refers to additional layers of information that are not directly encoded, as I said, by the DNA sequence, uh, but rather by chemical modifications of chromatin in form of DNA methylation and histone modifications, collectively known as the epigenetic code. So 
both the DNA and the histones uh, can be chemically modified. Uh, radical groups can be added to, to, to DNA and, uh, per, uh, and histones, and those mod modifications affect the function uh, of the genes where these modifications occur. Uh, deciphering this epigenetic code is, is uh, going to be very challenging uh, because you have to think that you have uh, one genome in one cell, but you, you will have many epigenomes uh, because in a particular cell, the modifications that uh, have occurred are not uh, necessarily going to be the same as the modifications that occurred in another type of cell. So, and, and that's uh, part of what contributes to making a kidney cell a kidney cell and a, a retina cell a retina cell. So these are, as, as I first uh, uh, said, this is an additional layer uh, of uh, regulation. So DNA methylation uh, occurs almost exclusively at, the cy at cytosines that are in CPG dinucleotides. So a, a cytosine next to a, a guanine uh, 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 nucleotide forming these dinucleotides. This is the substrate for the methylation. Uh, and, it, uh, and it's achieved by the addition of a methyl group to the fifth position of a cytosine ring. And there are enzymes, this is catalyzed by enzymes called methyl, DNA methyl transferases. Uh, the majority of the genome is, is rather poor in these CPG dinucleotides. And uh, the main reason for that is because uh, when, the, the, when a cytosine is uh, methylated, uh, and of course, this is only relevant if, if, uh, if it occurs in the germline because then it's going to be transmitted. If the cytosine is methylated, then uh, it can be, uh, uh, there can be a, a, a deamination uh, that will convert into a, a, a timing. So from a C it becomes a T. And this is a, 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 a frequent uh, uh, mutation. So many of uh, CPGs over uh, uh, evolutionary time uh, would then uh, mutate to uh, Ts, uh, C to T, and then the consequence is that uh, our, our genomes are, are rather poor uh, in these uh, CPG dinucleotides. Typically, you'll find uh, one uh, every hundred bases. So when we talk about epigenomics, we are actually referring to the constellation of uh, epigenetic alterations that, uh, that uh, occur in the entirety of the genome. Uh, as I said, DNA methylation uh, is one, and then the histone modifications a class, a, a group, another group of epigenetic uh, alterations. So uh, I want to focus on uh, DNA methylation. Uh, so what happens uh, when, if you have a gene and you have a control region of the gene, the promoter sequence uh, of the gene, uh, a, a, a large number, 70% uh, or so of the genes uh, in their regulatory region have um, so-called CPG island. So, so these are regions that are very rich in CPG dinucleotides. So very distinct from the, the average uh, uh, sequence in the genome. Like I said before, CPGs are poor, poorly represented uh, over on the genome. But these regions are regions that uh, uh, in the control region of a number of, uh, significant number of genes have a high density of CPG dinucleotides. If these uh, um, CPGs are 
uh, uh, not methylated, the transcription factors, proteins and complex of proteins that need to bind to this region so that DNA can be transcribed. Uh, this can happen if this region is not methylated. But if this region is methylated, then the transcription factors will not be able to bind. So the result is that that gene is not going to be transcribed. If that gene encoded a protein, there's no protein that's going to be made. So the methylation of this uh, uh, control region affects the transcription and therefore the activity of uh, that gene. Similarly, modifications in histones can also cause uh, suppression uh, of the transcription. This uh, slide is just to uh, 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 mention that the, the DNA methyltransferases uh, can be uh, grouped into those that that uh, the DNA, DNA methyltransferase one transferase one, which is responsible for maintenance of methylation from the, throughout the replication, to uh, the other uh, DNA methyltransferase like the 3A and 3B, which are responsible for the de novo uh, uh, methylation. So I talked about the uh, CPG islands uh, and uh, how uh, that is a site where uh, methylation uh, can uh, occur and when it occurs, it will have a functional consequence. Uh, and, but in addition to the CPG islands, uh, repetitive elements are a major uh, site where um, methylation occurs. Repetitive elements, like I uh, alluded uh, to before, they can be transcribed. I mentioned that when I, when I talked about the retrotransposition. Can all repeats be transcribed? No, not all, most cannot. But because there are so many copies, for example, uh, there is one type of repeat called ALU repeats. These ALU repeats occur at 1.2 million copies in the human genome. Uh, the ones that are more recent, evolutionarily speaking, have not accumulated mutations to the extent that they cannot be transcribed anymore. They, they have their own promoter sequence that enable their transcription. Over time, mutations accumulate. Those are not functional anymore. But there are still many, many copies that are, that are uh, functional. You don't want those uh, uh, elements to be uh, transcribed, those repeats to be transcribed. They, they reside mostly within genes or very close to genes. So you don't want uh, those repeats to be, tr to be transcribed they are suppressed, they are silenced by DNA methylation. So the vast majority of the repeats in the human genome are hypermethylated. So that's an important, uh, methylation is an important uh, mechanism to suppress these uh, repeats. Their suppression is very important not only because they are not going to be transcribed when they are methylated, but also because if they are not methylated, they are much more prone to undergo recombination events that will cause deletions and duplications. So because there are so many of these elements and because they are so similar in sequence, they can be, during uh, replication, they can, be, they can be misaligned and then you can generate deletions and duplications of the sequence that, that reside within them. And, and that is probably a, an important source of variation for uh, sequences that are under one kilobase that the, the majority of the methodologists cannot uh, detect. So methylation uh, occurs during normal development. And it's, uh, there is a program that's uh, very important for normal, normal uh, development. 
So after fertilization, the paternal genomic DNA is actively demethylated before DNA replication, and the maternal genomic DNA then starts to be passively demethylated with cleavage divisions. During implantation, there is the novo DNA methylation uh, that establishes the tissue-specific methylation patterns in somatic cells. So there is a, there is a, a whole program uh, during development for methylation that uh, is very specific and very uh, functionally de determinant uh, of uh, the normal development. How about uh, during aging? During aging, there is a, a, a global loss of, of uh, methylation that is observed. It's uh, you know, uh, not well known what the full scope of consequences uh, might be, uh, but there is certainly a, a, a decrease in CPG methylation uh, as we age. How about in cancer? In cancer is, is very interesting because there are two apparently paradoxical uh, epigenetic alterations that occur. At the same time, we see a loss of methylation occurring throughout the genome. And we also see gain of methylation that is more localized. Uh, so the increase in methylation typically will be in the CPG islands that are in the, in the control regions of uh, genes. And those uh, events will cause repression of gene transcription. What if that is a tumor suppressor gene? Then the repression of the tumor suppressor gene could be a key event uh, for development of that tumor. The global loss of methylation that occurs uh, in cancer also has a profound uh, uh, impact. Uh, many things can happen. First, as I mentioned, you're going to observe expression of retrotransposons. That will cause instability. Uh, these repeats will, uh, uh, it will be possible for them to, to be transcribed and to move, to integrate uh, at other places. These are all events that contribute to heterogeneity that is so uh, uh, commonly observed, so, so commonplace in tumors. That there, there's uh, uh, an, an, an increase uh, as the tumor grows in uh, variation that, that occurs at multiple levels that uh, make those uh, cells uh, more different. There can be expression of proto-oncogenes, genes that, uh, that uh, have oncogenic potential that are suppressed uh, in a normal cell. But if there is loss of methylation, these genes can be reactivated and that con can contribute to the oncogenic process. And then uh, what is most uh, well understood about the, the, the consequence of global loss of methylation in cancer is genomic genetic instability, genomic instability, because the loss of methylation of the repeats, as I mentioned before, renders them much more prone to undergo recombination events, uh, and then you start accumulating deletions and duplications and, and uh, uh, rearrangements of multiple uh, source, not just those uh, repeats, uh, but uh, satellite DNA sequence and a number of other uh, repeats will be affected by this. Uh, so, why well, I already uh, talked about this, I'm going to skip because it's not fair. You, you want to go have coffee. But this is, uh, uh, this is basically a, a sum up of what uh, we, we have been talking, that when you think about uh, cancer, uh, you have to think about genetic, uh, genetic uh, alterations and epigenetic alterations. Uh, you have both factors uh, 
contributing to the process that ultimately affects expression of uh, key genes uh, and uh, entire uh, networks of uh, proteins. This is just to emphasize that uh, uh, the majority of the CPG dinucleotides in the genome actually reside within repeats, not within the non-repetitive uh, DNA. Uh, I talk about that. So I, I will just say uh, briefly, uh, as an example, uh, talk to you about epigenetic alterations that uh, occur in pediatric uh, brain tumors. I have been studying these uh, brain tumors called ependymomas. They occur in children. Uh, they cannot, uh, an aggressive ependymoma cannot be distinguished from a non-aggressive ependymoma histologically. So if, if a pathologist examines uh, uh, these tumors, it's not possible to predict outcome. It's not possible to predict whether that uh, uh, tumor will develop aggressively or not. And uh, as you realize, especially for children, uh, it's very, uh, very complicated because you have to be certain that whatever a chemotherapeutic agent or radiation therapy uh, will, to a minimum uh, extent, affect the, uh, that, that child in the long run. And uh, unfortunately, most of these therapies uh, uh, leave a sequela. Most of these therapies will affect the uh, cognitive uh, function, uh, not to mention the increased uh, frequency in secondary malignancy later in life. So it's very important to be certain that that child really can benefit from the therapy and that uh, it's not a child who actually harbor a tumor that was not as aggressive, that, uh, did, that could have been spared from, from that uh, uh, treatment. So we have uh, attempted to identify epigenetic alterations that could be predictive of clinical behavior, and that's what we have been able to do for these uh, uh, ependymomas. We used um, a sequence-based approach to determine the methylation profile of 35,000 genomic loci simultaneously using large-scale sequencing. The key, and this is not something that, that, that we developed, this was already known, people use uh, everywhere. Uh, if you treat genomic DNA with uh, sodium bisulfite, what happens is that if the cytosine is not methylated, it gets converted to a T. But if it is methylated, it's not altered. So if you treat DNA with sodium bisulfite, and you sequence, since you know the reference genomic sequence, you can tell whether that cytosine was methylated or not. You can also know whether the treatment was 100% efficient or not. Uh, if it's not, you don't want to use that because it would be completely confusing. Because if the cytosine is not next to a, to a, a, to a guanine, then it's not going to be methylated because it's the CPG dinucleotides, it's the C in the CPG dinucleotides that, will be, that can be methylated. So if the cytosine is not next to a G, you know it wasn't methylated, you know it had to be converted to a T. So if it was not, you disregard that sequence because the treatment was not uh, complete. So doing these and generating you know, over three million sequences uh, from 35,000 different sites in the genome, we were able to uh, arrive at a few conclusions. First, that most of the CPGs, when you compare normal tissue with uh, tumors that were non-aggressive and aggressive and even recurrent uh, cases that, that we had, uh, didn't change. Most of the CPGs did not change. It's a small fraction that, uh, that changes. Uh, also, uh, what we found is that uh, 
uh, even though the loss of methylation predominantly affects repeats, uh, we found that some repeats actually are not methylated in a normal cell and they may gain methylation during cancer development, which was uh, uh, not known. We also found that the sequences that are outside of the repeats tend proportionally to actually lose more methylation than the repeats themselves. And we found that the population of repeats that lose methylation is not random. Uh, uh, when we compare several uh, 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 ependymomas, uh, it, is, it tends to be those same sites where the changes occur. When you look at uh, the global level of methylation, you see that a normal, a normal brain tissue compared to a primary tumor that's not aggressive, a primary tumor that is aggressive, and a recurrent tumor, these, uh, these uh, children uh, uh, often will have to go through multiple surgeries because after the first surgery, a few years later, then there will likely be a recurrence. So sometimes we had, we had uh, tissue from the recurrence and from the primary tumor. And what uh, we found was a statistically significant de decrease in the global level of methylation as you go from normal to primary non-aggressive to primary aggressive and to recurrent. Uh, we developed a, a, a web uh, site uh, and uh, uh, a number of uh, tools uh, that enable us to uh, depict the methylation status of a region. Each circle represents a CPG dinucleotide. If it's blue, it's because it's methylated. If it's yellow, it's because it has lost methylation. It's not methylated. So in normal tissue, you see this pattern. These are different CPGs, and each represents a sequence that we obtain. So we have all these uh, reads from this region. You see that the primary non-aggressive starts to show less methylation, more yellow. Uh, and uh, the primary aggressive, even more so. So uh, you see in a, in a specific uh, locus uh, uh, an example of uh, this loss of methylation. And then we started analyzing individual loci and determining whether if we use several of these loci uh, together, we would be able to discriminate a tumor that was not aggressive from a tumor that was aggressive. Uh, and we uh, were able, using uh, five loci, uh, to discriminate a, a, a good fraction uh, of these tumors, not all. They can all be, the, the, it's easy to, to differentiate uh, from the recurrent tumor, but between the, the primary tumors, uh, using just these five markers, uh, about a third or, or, or so of them could be uh, discriminated. So it's a work in progress, uh, but I think it's uh, hopefully uh, going, to be, going to be helpful. So this is uh, what I had. Up. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Another question about the last slides, um, about the classification. Is it, I know it's preliminary data, but is there any correlation between your classification to the responsiveness of the patients or if there's any recurrent tumor happen in those patients? I mean, just to, to get yeah, a sense of what- the, Yes, because the, the classification of aggressive and non-aggressive uh, was made based on outcome. So it was based on whether a recurrence was observed in less than three years, or if no recurrence was observed in more than five years. So typically when there is recurrence in these tumors, in less than one year, you already have a recurrence. So those two groups, recurrence in less than one year and no recurrence in at least five years, those were the groups that we were able to to identify patterns that were, at least for a good fraction of them, uh, discriminating. 
what if you take, uh, if you uh, analyze the patterns also in this uh, two groups, or in the several groups, but in normal tissue, not in cancer tissue, do you also see differences? Uh, that's what we did. We have uh, 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 several uh, normal human tissue controls from the same uh, uh, region of the brain uh, where these ependymal cells that give rise to the, to the tumors are located. So it's the uh, fourth ventricle of the, the brain, the, the, the lining of that. We have uh, microdissected uh, and used that as control.